This is Agent Provocateur with Alan Walsh and Adam Wilde. Welcome to another episode of Agent Provocateur. It's been a busy couple of weeks. Adam Wilde, you are a sight for sore eyes. <laughs> Am I? I'm, I'm a greasy sight. It's rainy here, Alan. I got soaked on the way in. It's been raining for 48 hours straight in Toronto, so... I'm a little jealous of your L.A. weather. Um, and you've been busy, huh? I have been. I have been. Took off to uh, Rome and Sicily. Uh, my son's doing a semester abroad mm-hmm. in Rome. And uh, it's sort of a rite of passage that parents go over and visit with their kids as they're uh, living in Europe. He's been there since early January. And, uh, and right about now, he's a Rome local. Oh, <laughs> what's uh, what was the favorite thing that he showed you? Like, did he learn any local cool spots that he took you to? The, the um, cafes and the little bakeries and uh, some of his little hole in the wall uh, Italian spots um, in Trastevere, um, in this really cool hip area. It's and and it's unbelievable. You go out at night and. Everyone's speaking English. I'm like, I said to my son, I go, what's going on here? He goes, dad, they're all university students. And they're all from the U.S., from everywhere. (laughs) And and it's it's unbelievable. That's very cool. Very, very cool. I'm I'm really jealous. I had a, my sister-in-law, I think, did uh, a semester in France and said it was incredible. I'm a dropout, so I never really got that opportunity. <laughs> I, ne- I never did it, and, and I highly recommend anybody out there, uh, any, any parents, really encourage your kids to go do that. They, um, they don't have classes Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so literally every weekend they go visit a different European city. Amazing. So he's been to Dublin for St. Patrick's Day weekend, Vienna, Prague, Bratislava. Uh, he just he just arrived in Malta today. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Lucky guy. And you must be. Uh, it must be very cool seeing your your kids because both of them are out now, kind of doing it on their own, surviving on their own. Yeah, I was in uh, Western Canada going to a junior game, and I'm getting a photo from my son wine tasting in Tuscany, and I'm <laughs> and I'm I'm saying, what is wrong? What is wrong with this picture? Yeah, it feels a little bit backwards. <laughs> so, Alan, I mean, obviously, this week's been, you know, so what do they what do they say? Sometimes 10 years go by and nothing happens. And then sometimes a week goes by and it feels like it's been 10 years. Um, it looks as though uh, the Coyotes are leaving. Um, it's not 100% confirmed. Uh, there's been... Uh, there's been conversations, uh, you know, Elliot Friedman, Frank Saravalli, and Chris Johnson all reporting on this stuff. Uh, and then there was a, a, a comment from somebody within the organization yesterday saying, saying we're still working hard to keep them here. But the rumor is that they're going to Utah uh, and that it could happen as early as April 18th. Um, I just want to know, uh, I, I think everybody wants to know um, what you know. And then, of course, what the ramifications would be if this is in fact goes through. So when we talk about it on this episode, I think like the first thing I want to start with is what do you know? Where are they at in the process right now? So what, I, what I've heard is very similar to what has been reported thus far. There is a, and it's a very complicated series of transactions. Um, it's not a sale of the Coyotes to the Smith Entertainment Group in Salt Lake City. Um, What I hear is happening is the NHL is actually purchasing the franchise from uh, uh, the Morello Group uh, and then turning around and selling the franchise to Smith Entertainment Group in a really complicated series of transactions. Um, I hear the price tag of around a billion dollars the NHL is going to pay to purchase the team Mm -hmm. and approximately a billion three to sell the team to Smith Entertainment Group. The 300 million differential 
will be classified as a relocation fee. And that relocation fee will be equitably distributed amongst all the current owners. Wow. It's a significant windfall for some, some teams. And, and so, so I want to ask you this, obviously you got to have the relocation fee, which is probably why the NHL gets involved in that, because I think that would be confusing for a lot of people. The NHL buys the franchise and resells it because they want the relocation fee built into the deal. Is that, that the reason they're getting in the middle of this? Um, I, I think there's other issues, um, ancillary to the actual transaction. Um, the uh, Morello Group, uh, from what I hear, is retaining our uh, rights to the territory uh, of the state of Arizona and the Phoenix area to build an arena. Mm -hmm. And the term that I heard that I really hadn't heard before is reactivate the franchise. Uh, within a five-year window. So basically, they're saying to Merlello, staying in mullet without a shovel in the ground is no longer feasible for the players and for the league. Mm -hmm. Hurrah, they finally have realized that. But if you are able to get your arena deal done, and build the arena, you will own the next iteration of a Coyotes franchise. Okay. And in that, there would be a five-year window on that. Alan, I think people have questions about the fact that, that okay, so he, Morello bought the franchise for $300 million in 2019. Um, you know, under this proposed deal, he would be walking away with, and, you know, there's taxes and fees and whatever, but $700 million in well, profit. Well, he, he bought the team for $300 million, but he also assumed a significant amount of debt. Okay. okay. Uh, and, and and that was layered over the $300 million price tag. He's certainly um, making a profit. Mm -hmm. um, the, he, he, it's From what I hear, it's beyond just making him whole. Mm -hmm. He's walking away with uh, a substantial gain. I just don't think it's as much as 700 million. Do you think that he'll then parlay that money into building this complex that he's trying to build outside of Scottsdale? Or is it entirely possible he just walks away with the money and says, okay, I'm, I'm done. And I'm just going to go back to my original business. <clears throat> I honestly don't know. Uh, okay. I, I think um, his intention is to um, build this arena and and arena district uh, in in the area that he's targeting right now in the, the land auction on June the 27th. It'll be very interesting to see if he actually goes through with buying the land. Right? right. Because, because um, if the move... If the relocation is going to happen, it has to happen fast. Right. And and I heard um, if this is going through, that Ryan Smith intends to go to Arizona and actually meet with the players on the Coyotes before um, they disperse for the offseason. Okay. So it's going to be... Uh, everything will be happening in the next week mm -hmm. or it won't. And um, what I've also heard is that everything has been verbally agreed to. Now it comes down to getting everybody's signature on all of these documents. Yes. And that's the stage that we're at right now. Uh, is it possible that this entire series of transactions falls through in the next week it is okay but it is all trending towards happening okay and um i, I want to know from you uh the agent's view and 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 the player's view on this because 
you know, we've heard rumors, although no one's kind of quite come out and said it about the difficulties of playing at Mullet. Uh, the fact that that certain players have not really enjoyed their time there. Um, you know, uh, but we've also heard the other side of it, which is there's a lot of Coyotes fans that are really disappointed. The fact that there are even Coyotes fans at this point is sort of a miracle given what the franchise has seen over, especially over the last 15 years. Um, and, and so, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, what do you think the player view is? What do you think the NHLPA view on all of this is? Well, I think the players have been through a lot. And uh, I think that the last, especially the last couple of years since the move into Mullet has uh, taken a real toll on the players who've been there. Um, it's not ideal. And, and more than that, it's living day to day with the indecision, with the in instability of, of not knowing how this is all going to play out, you know. We have a deal. We're having a vote. The vote, oh, we're going to win the vote. The vote isn't just a rubber stamp. We lose the vote. And there's just been so many ups and downs um, in this saga. Going all the way back to the original plan to build an arena in Scottsdale with the Elman Group way back when um, the... Balzilli sale, the litigation in Arizona, um, uh, his his loss in court, um, the you know the NHL taking over the franchise and running it for two seasons. There's just been so much that people have gone through. Um, the fans, the local media. Mm -hmm. I think that everybody at this stage needed closure. And one thing I have to say, credit to Marty Walsh and the NHLPA for speaking up at the All-Star Game about the situation in Phoenix. Because if Marty Walsh had not said what he said at All-Star, I think there's a great likelihood this would have continued on at least another year in mullet and i wow. think when he took an aggressive stand you know speaking on behalf of the players that set the wheels in motion where gary and other people at the league said okay this is this is not tenable to stay here long term without a shovel in the ground right and and what do you think it was about what Marty Walsh said that 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 pushed this? Because, you know, as an outsider, Alan, I look at that and I go, so all the PA had to do was say something, uh, you know, like it just seems like that's the thing that that's the that's the straw. Why was that the straw? It's a great question. I think that um, Marty Walsh and the PA um, have taken some aggressive stances um they were very proactive with the whole columbus blue jackets mm -hmm. um issue when they hired uh, mike babcock and those revelation revelations came out um marty got on the plane went to columbus sat down met with the players face to face right away got to the bottom of the story Mm -hmm. uh, got to what actually happened and then got on a plane from Columbus, went to New York and met with Gary. And that was the end. Uh, and I, and I think there is a, um, uh, an energized NHLPA right now, uh, that is, uh, much more proactive in advocating for players and and willing to take issues and go public with them if necessary mm -hmm. and i think i think marty walsh was getting a little bit of the runaround on arizona and he had said um you know what's the deal he was told december is a deadline you'll have news 
there needs to be a deal by December 2023, um, or we're going to look at other options. In December, it was give us another month. Now we're into January. In January, uh, nothing. Uh, so I think Marty took the issue into his own hands and and went public and said, this status quo is not acceptable. And I think it served as a catalyst. And um, for the for the players that are signed in, in Arizona, now they have a lot of free agents coming up this year. Um, but, you know, uh, I think one of the things people ask is like, for no trade protection, seems like a ridiculous thing to ask, but you know, if, if, um, uh, if I have a no trade clause and the coyotes or, or Arizona are on it, uh, if they move to Utah, does that transfer over? Am I still able to, to block a trade to the Utah franchise or is that null and void at this point? So there's two issues and both of them are going to be subject to negotiation between, um, the NHLPA and the league. The first issue is um, players receiving a each player individually who will be moving from Arizona to Salt Lake, if this happens, will be receiving a relocation fee somewhere in the amount of $25,000 per player. Um, and that's to offset the cost of um, if you own a house, if you have um, a condo, an apartment, um, shutting everything down and moving to a new city if you're under contract for next year. Um, the other issue, as you identified, is what to do with uh, limited no trade clauses mm -hmm. uh, where you list a number of teams that you cannot be traded to or a number of teams that you can be traded to. Um, opening up those lists uh, to either perhaps add Salt Lake because there could be a reason you don't want to go there or taking slash Arizona Salt Lake off your list and adding another team. And that is still subject to negotiation between both sides. I expect there will be some accommodation uh, in that area. And and in terms of uh, Smith Entertainment Group, Ryan Smith specifically, tech billionaire, owner of the Utah Jazz, do you have any impressions of this group? Because it's not a perfect situation that the Coyotes and whatever they're going to be called next franchise are walking into. This is a arena that is built for um, built for basketball, has to be retrofitted. There will be some block view, a la the you know when when the Islanders played in Brooklyn for a few years. Um, I think 13,000 is the capacity for hockey and there is a new arena coming for the Olympics, but you know, the reality is that again, not a perfect situation for a franchise that has not had a permanent home in about 20 years. Uh, what are your, what are your thoughts on the Smith entertainment group and the situation that this franchise is going to walk into? Should they move? I I've watched how, uh, they run, uh, the Utah jazz and I've, um, read several interviews with Ryan Smith, and I've looked at some of his public comments um, regarding uh, the whole Coyote situation, and I think he's going to be a fabulous um, uh, uh, forward-thinking owner coming into the NHL. I think he's going to uh, build uh, a great hockey operations team. I think he's going to uh, spend the money that needs to be spent to bring in the right players. And I think he's going to be dedicated from day one to putting a winning team on the ice because if the team is winning, uh, everything is, everything is golden. Right. Right. All that, all the bad stuff goes away. And if they have the support, do you think that, that players on the ice are excited about this? Do you think that they're hesitant about this? Are they like, how, how would you feel if you're under contract long-term with this franchise? How do you think it, this, this news, if it is to come to pass, is going to be received? I think the players, uh, obviously, who wouldn't um, love living in Arizona. 
we're, we're exactly. you know, Scottsdale yeah. is an incredible place to live. Uh, I think so from, you know, you, you, as in any other city, you live in an area, you make friends, kids go to schools, uh, you have a life there, you've built a life there. And uh, moving to a new place causes, you know, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of disruption in your daily life. However, I think from a, a general perspective, while it's sad that the team wasn't able to make it in Arizona, there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm for what Salt Lake presents to be in the future. And and for um, for the NHL itself, and this this brings up the the issue of expansion, and obviously something that the NHL, with its last two franchises in Vegas and Seattle, has done quite well with. You know, it's created more jobs for the players, um, more money for the billionaires, brand new arenas, uh, Stanley Cup, uh, pretty pretty successful, I would say, the last six or seven years, um, and a pretty attractive proposition. Uh, because the leagues like the MLB, the NBA, and the NFL are not really in expansion mode. They are happy with the 30 teams that they have in each of those leagues. Um, two markets, though, seem to be leading the charge on where the NHL will expand to next, Alan. And it's funny because both of those markets is where ostensibly hockey hasn't worked. The first one is Atlanta. The other one as you mentioned earlier in the show, is a reactivation of the Coyotes franchise. If the NHL leaves, and Chris Johnson always says this, their first priority is going to be back to Arizona. Why do you think, and do you think, because um, I don't want to assume that you you do think, you know, with the two groups interested in Atlanta, with Murello holding the, the, the rights to reactivate the Coyotes franchise within five years, do you think that both of those markets are ultimately tenable if the NHL does expansion right this time? Uh, I do, but you also left out Houston. Houston, and, okay. and And Houston is also in the mix for um, an expansion team. Um, someone told me yesterday, connected with NHL ownership, that the final price tag on expansion will be $2 billion a franchise. And I said, come on. He's, I said, come on, two billion, not a chance. And it's a very credible person. Wow. He uh, owns a piece of an NHL team, and he said, "Alan, you watch." He says, "Right now, the talk is a bit, you know, a billion five. When we actually get there, if you see where the value of NHL franchises are today." It's going to be two billion. Write it down. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, Alan, you know that makes what Bill Foley paid in 2015 or 2016, which was 500 million, and um, what essentially Amazon paid in in you know Seattle, which I believe was 650 million, seem like an absolute steal. How yeah. come? How come the diff the price differential only half a decade later? What what what's led to this? I think what's uh, partly leading to the uh, uh, explosion in uh, franchise values, especially in the NHL, is number one, they've got the most restrictive CBA with regards to controlling labor costs, i.e. the salary cap. Yep. Um, there's only a limited amount of franchises available, and the NHL can't really expand in, in 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 any of our thinking beyond 34 teams. So it's a very limited group of people who can now apply to and join the country club, the okay. country club of NHL owners. And uh, because of that, expansion fees in these cities are going through the roof mm -hmm. and there are projections that have been made going forward 10 and 15 years where these franchises will ultimately be worth north of five billion dollars each wow okay i gotta ask 
there have been projections out there about the fact that what a league would look like with 36 or 40 teams. Why do you think that 34 is the number? I don't think we have enough players to, um, at least right now, uh, worldwide to be able to uh, uh, populate more than 34 teams without bringing down the quality of the game to a um, an extent that would impact the, the the product on the ice. So you need stars. You need you need you need players. You need players. and 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 I don't know if you've got a you know each team. We're talking about twenty three um, players on the NHL roster, fifty contracts. Um, if you've got uh, Arizona, you got Houston, you got Atlanta. Um, you're ta- you're you're talking at the end of the day. You know, 150 contracts and, uh, you know, 70, 70 players. And, and uh, yeah, so that's a, that's significant and it's difficult to, you know, with all the other leagues too, where players can go and make more money than they could say in the AHL or even the ECHL um, over in Europe, you know, you can make a pretty good living over there uh, if you're not an NHL level player. So there's a lot of reasons why you probably wouldn't stay in North America Alan, you know, one of the things that's come up in Canada, um, you know, with this relocation is, you know, why is the NHL, from certain people's perspective, forgetting about Canadians? Why are we not putting a second team in Quebec? Why are we not putting a second team in southern Ontario? Uh, because OVG, o- Oakview Group, is is building something in Hamilton that they say is not an NHL arena, although it will be NHL-sized in spec and ice delivery and all of those things, kind of like Cops Coliseum was in the 80s when a team was supposed to go to Hamilton. What What is the reason, and I could suspect I know a few reasons, but what would be the reason that they are not even considering a Quebec or a Hamilton or somewhere else? Well, let's focus first on um, the GTA and having a second team in Toronto. Um, you've got other sports that have... Uh, franchises, multiple franchises in the same city, some iconically Mets, Yankees, White Sox, um, Cubs. Um, it's it's happened before. Toronto and the New York Rangers are the two biggest revenue generating teams in the NHL, and by far, um, if you want to hear a stat. There is a two hundred and twenty million dollar revenue differential between the Toronto Maple Leafs this year and the Arizona Coyotes. Wow! Right, this is what we're talking about now. The NHL has a cap system. Mm-hmm. As a player's advocate, I would argue the NHL has an absolute duty to maximize their revenues every year. If the entire system is based on splitting the revenues 50, 50 with the players. Right. And that's been the biggest argument about Arizona all these years. You played uh, for years in Gila. You played for several years in mullet you've restricted the amount of revenue that franchise can make and um, that is impacted to a significant extent in some years hrr Mm -hmm. and the players get 50 percent of that now the players have no management rights they don't have the right to run the business in any way Gary calls them partners, but they're not partners at the table in making decisions on how the league is being run. That's the league, right? So Mm -hmm. these decisions have been made that in many ways restrict uh, and limit how much ultimately the players receive every year in compensation. A team, a second team in the GTA, whether it's in Hamilton, Kitchener, Waterloo, um, would be a goldmine. Make no mistake, 
instantaneously, it would be a top four revenue team in the NHL. More revenue, higher cap, more player compensation, and also more uh, revenue towards the league, the owner side as well. So why don't we do it? Why don't you imagine the rivalry that would be created? Look at what had been created or in the past between the Canadians and the Nordiques. Yeah. Well, the Leafs have territorial rights over the area. Mm-hmm. And we have said time and time and time again, there will never be a second NHL team in the GTA. Uh, we'll never allow it. Wow. Now, now, is that good for the NHL? No. Is it good for the players? No. Is it good for all the other owners? No. And I'm not surprised, but disappointed that this issue hasn't been pushed years and years and years ago more than it should have been. So there is there is a world where if the NHL pushed it, decided to push it, that could change. Yes, and it, it would involve um, significant compensation, mm-hmm. uh, not just, uh, I mean, I would envision, uh, not just uh, in a transaction when the time comes, but revenues flowing for years from this new entity to the Leafs to uh, compensate them for the um, encroachment of their territory. And what about the issue of Quebec? Why why is Quebec not under consideration? Quebec City. I've advocated for years to bring the Nordiques back. I think um, Gary's biggest nightmare would be a Winnipeg Quebec Stanley Cup final. Right. Right. It's the marquee in in his mind. He wants you know, big market and, and, and we all do right for, I mean, a New York Ranger, LA King, Stanley cup final, a, uh, uh, New York, Chicago, Stanley cup final, uh, a Toronto, uh, LA King. I mean, have the biggest revenue generators in the league, the anchors, so to speak, thrown out there on the national stage. Fabulous. Fabulous. You know, I mean, the Four Nations tournament coming up, which is the precursor to having a a World Cup on the hockey calendar consistently um, uh, uh, every two years having an international event, whether it's World Cup or Olympics, uh, putting the World Cup back on the calendar. This time they can only get it to four teams for a lot of different reasons, some political. Um, You're going to end up having uh, Canada Mm -hmm. versus the U.S. on ABC, the big network. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And that's coming. And it's coming in February 2025. Right. And all the big stars in the in the world. Um, uh, okay. And so so that would be the reason. So that's painful to hear. Alan, this is a bit of a digression of a question, but I think it's important in the in the scope of the NHL and what we've been talking about today. The NBA and the MLB specifically, the the NFL to a lesser extent, because teams like Green Bay, you know, have been very successful franchises for years and are not a big revenue or a big market, but they are big revenue generators. They've got cult like fans. Um, you know, the, the, the MLB has a soft salary cap. They've got a luxury cap. So teams like New York won for years and years and years. Um, although they haven't lately Boston, another team that won for years and years and years, Los Angeles who can defer, you know, 90% of Shohei Otani's salary until the next decade. Um, they're doing everything that they can, uh, in both of those sports for, some of these big matchups to happen. The NHL solution to big matchups happening is having them happen in the first round when teams two and three play each other for some reason in the seeding. You never see the NHL attempt to, 
Like there's an obsession with parody. There's an obsession with parody, but also they know, and there's also an obsession with, well, we really like the money revenue generating teams to go deep. Has the NHL kind of been talking out of both sides of their mouth or I guess through their actions as well? Because I look at this and I go, okay, you want the big clubs to, to bring in the big bucks while well, they need to go deep into the playoffs. Um, why are you making it so difficult for them to make it through the first round? Why are you making it so difficult for them to retain star power? What, you know, these are the types of things that don't seem to make sense when we talk about, oh, we'd love a New York in the finals. Oh, we'd love a Los Angeles in the finals. What are your thoughts on that? I think the NHL has been obsessed with the illusion of parody because um, that's how they were ultimately able to sell a salary cap to the media and to the public. Um, you know, we're, this lockout is for you. Mm -hmm. Remember Gary Bettman saying this is for the, the lockout is for the fans um, because we're going to establish parody and, all the time, my Twitter feed blows up all the time when we talk about the cap. Um, uh, it, it, we, we have parody. The NHL has parody. Yes. Yeah. There is no parody. <laughs> that parody is a total illusion. If anybody thinks the NHL cap has brought parody to the NHL, you have drank the Kool Aid. <laughs> right. If if you if you look at the top spending teams and a correlation between that in the cap system and winning, go look at um, pre two thousand four when the Detroit Red Wings were close to ninety million in payroll. The New York Rangers were in the 80 millions in payroll and all these other teams. And there was, and they didn't buy cups. No. Nope. Because they had, the, they were the biggest markets. They spent the most on salaries and it very rarely translated to success on the ice uh, in, in the form of championships. In the form of championships. Mm hmm. Toronto Maple Leafs were always one of the biggest spenders all through uh, the 90s and early 2000s, right up at the top of the league every year. I don't remember the Leafs winning any cups back then. Nope. Sadly well, not. Well, you cannot replace good drafting, player development, uh, savvy uh, free agent signings, uh, coach, coaching staffs, you can't replace all that with just money. So the people who say, oh, the cap brings parity to the NHL, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay. All right. Alan, uh, this has been a, uh, a fascinating kind of discussion about, about, about this. Um, I want to, I want to end on, you know, as of this recording, it's April 12th. <laughs> Um, what do you put the percentage at that this goes through, you know, you know, that the coyotes are not there next year. What do you, if you were to guess, and I know this is sort of an unfair question because there's no way it could be some lawyer that holds things up. You never know. Um, what do you think the percentages are? How far along are we to this happen? I would say there's a 90% chance this transaction, uh, completes and, and we have an announcement by April 18th. Okay. All right. Well, Alan, thank you uh, for, for getting up really early. If, for, for those that don't know, I got Alan up uh, super early this morning to do the show. So uh, it's not even the sun's not even up in Los Angeles yet. And he's uh, been kind enough to come in. Um, it's uh, that's this is one of the most fascinating times I think we've ever had on this show. And, and I think it's one of the most fascinating times in the history of the NHL. So Alan, thank you for your insight. Uh, it makes a lot of reading the tea leaves a lot clearer so we appreciate it always a pleasure this has been agent provocateur with alan walsh and adam wild follow alan walsh on twitter at walsh a subscribe wherever you get your podcast by searching agent provocateur and hitting the subscribe button youtube.com sdpn